Okay, so we're now going to move on to the second part of our ship finance in 2021 and beyond. Um, I'd like to uh, invite the, uh, that panel to uh, pop up, please. Our moderator is Mr. Stuart McAlpine, who's Global Head of Marine Projects at INS. And Stuart is going to lead a discussion on ship finance, trends, products, and pricing. Stuart, please. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, thank you to Marine Money for doing this. Hope you can all hear me. And, um, and a warm welcome to uh, part two of uh, session four. Um, I'm Stuart McAlpine from INTS and delighted to be moderating today's panel, which will address uh, the state of the ship finance market in 2021 and beyond. We've got quite a lot to cover. And so without further ado, let me just introduce uh, the panelists to you, if I may. Um, first of all, we have um, in, in no particular order, Mr. Kim Bella from TORM, CFO of TORM. Give us a wave, Kim. Um, Gaurav Mulwaini, Executive Director of Shipping Finance at, um, um, at Santa Chartered Bank. And then we, we have Mr. Shreyas Chipalkati, Global Head, Shipping, Logistics and Offshore at City. Shreyas, good to see you. Um, then we have Mr. Torellin Kilstad, Managing Director of S Marine Advisors, based up there in his, in his loft in Oslo. And um, Mr. Ian Weber, CEO of Global uh, Ship Lease. So I think we've got a very well-balanced panel here to talk about um, ship finance uh, in 2021 and beyond. So I'm going to start with the first question, if, if, if I may, um, which um, actually just for a brief moment is going to look backwards. Um, so before we go, before we look forward, gentlemen, could each of you please uh, give your views on the state of the the ship finance market in 2020 and how, you know, notwithstanding this terrible uh, pandemic we've um, lived through and are still living through, um, how your projects and transactions advanced. Um, and then there's a sort of a second part to it, which is what surprised you most about last year's market. So Gaurav, maybe I could I could start with you on that one, if, if I may. Sure, Stuart, thanks. Uh, uh, it's an interesting question. So what did 2020 hold for us? I think, um, it has been actually a very interesting year. If I think back uh, this time last year when sort of everything around COVID was evolving, I think there was a lot of nervousness. And I think for a lot of companies and banks, people were not sure what to expect. Will it be a couple of weeks, couple of months or how long drawn it will be? I think uh, a lot of banks uh, decided to sort of pull back, take stock. We'll be looking at some sort of major financial crisis, et cetera. But I think now that we look back, it seems to, at least from a shipping perspective, seem to have worked out quite well. I think most of the sectors uh, proved to do well. Uh, we all know the tankers, the container ship segment, et cetera. So I think wearing a shipping hat, it didn't quite turn out to be as bad as what we were all thinking maybe in sort of Q1 this time last year. And to answer your second question, I think what surprised me the most, I think was the performance on the container ship industry. I think the way the players pulled together and uh, the, the storm overall, it was uh, it was pretty spectacular, and I'm hoping that that sort of represents a fundamental shift in uh, in the way we see that industry going forward. Great, yes, and I, I mean I I think that uh, mentioning that mentioning that sector is um, um, is interesting, and maybe we'll have a chance to discuss that a bit more. Let's go to a, a for a ship owner view. So, Ian, maybe you could give maybe you could give your views briefly on 2020 and um, what surprised you most? I guess it's a, uh, given your sector, it's not a bad segue. No, thank you. Um, <laughs> we're just rolling back to 2019. Unfortunately, we pushed out all of our 2020 maturities during the course of 2019. Uh, so uh, our um, balance sheet was relatively clean, but we had set ourselves the objective of refinancing some very expensive high yield notes early in 2020, which obviously went by the board. Uh, but 2020 for us seemed to be two halves, a game of two halves. Um, the first half in container shipping, very uncertain. Uh, nobody knew what was going on. Uh, sources of finance were uh, limited, constrained, nervous. Um, and then the second half with uh, a significant recovery in the sector um, as uh, capacity was well controlled uh, and demand picked up. Uh, banks and other financing institutions open for business, and we could redust our plans, reinvigorate our plans to um, to refinance our bonds, um, which we did. We announced uh, that uh, recently and completed it last week, uh, and that was with a unitranche, 230 odd million dollar um, 
senior secured kind of regular way bank debt, uh, but provided by Hafen. Um, so achieving that objective, and, and this is a bit of a forward look into to 2021, uh, that, that, that allowed us uh, to announce a, a dividend, uh, which allowed us to raise equity, which we completed on yesterday. Oh. Uh, and along the way, during the course of 2020, um, we raised um, 30, 40 million dollars under an at the market program um, where uh, brokers essentially sold stock um, in dribs and drabs um, and uh, or, or securities, publicly traded securities. And those were our baby bonds, which is unsecured debt yielding uh, 8% uh, and some perpetual preferred uh, stock, which is undiluted equity effectively. Um, which currently, well, it pays uh, eight and seven, uh, eight and uh, three quarters. So we've been, we've been pretty active uh, in the second half of the year, raising capital from a number of different sources and getting ready for this current year. Thanks, Ian, and congratulations on on yesterday's closing. Um, uh, well done, well done to you and your, your colleagues for that. So let's switch back to um, a, a bank perspective. Sh Shreyas, over over to you. Thank, thank you, Stuart. Um, Look, I, th I mean, Ian, Ian sort of summarized it. It was, it was a, a year of two halves, right? I mean, we started the year, and uh, certainly in city, we, we look at shipping as a shipping logistics, offshore crews, all of that together. And, and we started the year with this incredible um, Dubai Ports World Take Private, which, which was a very tough deal. We got it in just under the wire as, as the quarantines hit. And the market sort of uh, did a little tumble and a swoon, and, and then came back. So, so that was an interesting start to the year. But then, obviously, as Gaurav has said, you know, the the whole recovery on the container shipping side was interesting to watch. Um, what happened to oil prices was interesting to watch. Uh, uh, the, the the scramble of how people behave in in, in a pandemic like this. So, uh, you know, that was interesting to watch. How how. Um, you know, civilized uh, societies are supposed to behave and how they actually behaved in, in the initial mm -hmm. stages. That was interesting. So all of this uh, sort of came together towards the end of the year. Look, I think we, we've had a very interesting year. We've done our deals that we set out to do. Uh, I think the outlook, you know, for 21, we'll talk about that in a minute, I suppose, but uh, it's, it's, it's going to be um, a very volatile uh, next few years because we're seeing this incredible, um, another point in the future of our discussion, but incredible mm. impact of ESG. And I, that's where I segue into what surprised me the most this year was the immense speed with which hydrogen came on to the agenda. In the last three, four months, it has absolutely just taken everyone's imagination by storm. And I, I don't know the reality of how quickly that will turn into real projects, but. Yeah. It just shows you yeah. by at what speed you can actually have um, a new topic emerge in what was already a very complicated and contested ESG space uh, at the beginning of the year. Yes. So I think COVID's impact on ESG is something that will be very um, a major input into how financing yes. uh, goes forward. Thanks, Shreyas. And it's it's interesting, you know, the, the comments that you made there about hydrogen. And I think we've all lived through this last year and we've seen a compression of change in so many different industries, in so many different uh, um, areas of our lives, really. And I think, you know, in ESG, um, with the Poseidon principles and in, um, you, you know, shipping moving towards the goals that it's moving towards, I think that that compression applies there as well as it, as it does in, in any other industry. And of course, that's a, a great thing to see. So Kim, can I just bring bring you in um, on the on the owner product tank, product tanker side and uh, ask for your th thoughts on last year briefly? Yes, yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, yeah, you're right. We are in product tank, uh, so I'll start with the latter question. Uh, what surprised us or surprised me? Uh, what did not surprise me? I actually didn't uh, um, uh, when I reflected on it think about the ESG, but uh, when thinking back to it, it has had an immense push. But else, when we entered into 2020, we had the IMO 2020, so it was strong markets, uh, strong market conditions. Then the, the COVID came and the OPEC plus price war, uh, supply uh, war came. The low oil prices contangled also, very high freight rates, uh, record highs, uh, wow. stock buildups, floating storage. And then the second COVID-19 round hit us once again, prolonged the recovery. So it was a, a 
a quite special year. Uh, so thinking back also, um, uh, timing-wise, uh, we got the description in the beginning. Um, uh, from Ian, timing-wise, uh, if you were to refinance in the beginning of the COVID-19, uh, where tenors were down to like in banks, bank lending two to two and a half years maximum, increased margins with plus 50 basis point on, on regular, mar uh, regular uh, funding. Uh, so timing was important. We refinanced a lot part of our fleet uh, last year, 51 uh, vessels out of say 76 uh, to 80. Uh, we did, as uh, the two others have mentioned, split in two. We did the first part in January, quite good or quite lucky, uh, at very decent uh, margins and terms. And we did the latter part in uh, Q4. Um, so, so quite good timing, uh, and uh, and now we have uh, no re major refinancing until the 26, 27, um, and we ended uh, 2020 in extremely good shape, uh, lending markets wise, uh, lending willingness uh, at very competitive pricing in terms of both uh, margins and uh, and leverage. Uh, so I think liquidity is there. Uh, that's an obvious uh, sign of that. Uh, I th also think it has to do with fewer projects, fewer new buildings. So uh, to uh, to the right uh, uh, projects and uh, of course companies, um, uh, liquidity is there. Another thing I, I reflected on is uh, just if we remember back to LIBOR rates and uh, long-term rates, um, they were like uh, 175, 180 in the beginning of the year. Now they are back to 0 0.2, 0 0.5. Mm. So quite a dramatic change there also. Um, and uh, yeah, and else Chinese lease is there. I, I would expect us to come back to that point also, but it has also been there and developed during uh, 2020. Sure. So quite a quite a dramatic year. Thank you, Kim. Thank you for those comments. And um, that's another nice segue to you, to you, Torelling. You're going to talk more about Chinese leasing a little bit later on in the in the discussion. But any sort of thoughts on on um, 2020 just just yeah, before that? Just, yeah. Just just some brief comments. I mean, obviously, it has been a mix and a, and a different kind of year, but it you know it, it became kind of more normal after the first Corona shock, I would say. So that, that was a bit of a surprise that we came back to a more normal business environment again mm -hmm. during the year. Uh, and I also subscribed to the comment on the container market. That was a big surprise, you know, mm -hmm. last year. All in all, I would say, given the circumstances, last year has been okay. It's not not a great year, but it was okay. And I. I think there has been decent financing activities with banks, with Chinese mm -hmm. leasing and other providers of funds. So I think it turned out you know, not that bad, you know. So I'll leave it like that. Thank you, Torelling. Um, and um, so we're going to look forward now. Um, and so I really want to direct this question at uh, uh, Shreyas and, and Gaurav. And Shreyas, maybe you could kick off with it, kick off with it. So really, it's just to hear your thoughts on how you see the availability of finance for shipping in the coming year or two. And which sectors look to you to be to be particularly interesting, um, and maybe say something about the pricing environment for shipping deals? I'm sure people will be um, all ears for that. So, Shreyas. Thank you, Stuart. Um, look, I think first of all, to, to sort of paint the landscape of borrowers, I think there are, there are two distinct groups, two large, important distinct groups. Obviously, there are many groups of borrowers. But the two large important groups are people who have done well in 2020 beyond their wildest dreams. And here I'm talking about, you know, obviously the, the container shipping companies. Uh, and then, of course, the others who have done well, some tank companies, some others who have done well, but who want to pivot away from hydrocarbons into the renewable space. And the most interesting uh, name here is obviously what Scorpio Bulkers is doing, you know, with the with divesting the bulk ships and then turning into a wind turbine yeah. installation. Yeah, um, I think that's those are the two. Those are the two areas. Those are the two challenges. I think that that banks and ECAs and bond markets and private basement lenders, all of those will 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 have to look carefully at. Um, there is a lot of firepower in the banking community to to fund the right deals. I think pricing is what it is. There are. If, you, if you're an Asian borrower, high quality Asian borrower, you can get away with 150, 180. Uh, but if, but you know you can't do that in, in Europe, uh, in America, out of the question. But it's a, it's it really doesn't matter what you pay if you've got the right strategy, uh, mm -hmm. unless you're paying way too high. I mean, I'm talking, looking at it here, 
and the the cost of the high yield bonds that was a little bit you know needed to be fixed obviously but it's a it's it's a it's really about strategy and it's not about capex it's more about positioning your company for pivoting or for growth and then what are you going to do with the money so if you look at the container liners and their ambitions in the in the logistics space you know that's those are a series of small deals you know you're not you're not going to go out for a big deal you're going to go look at a number of smaller right. acquisitions as they've been doing right uh, and those are sort of the 100 150 200 million dollar range um, and so that's not going to attract tremendous bank appetite because maybe it's not even needed if you're sitting on a billion of of uh, of revolver liquidity and another couple of billion in, in cash you know uh, you, you, you can spend um, rather freely on smaller uh, acquisitions but it's really about how to get those deals actually identified where do you want to expand is it latin america is it asia is it you know which logistics firms are you going to look at um, we saw for example cms cgm buying uh, into an airline right and, yeah. and some air freight um, capacity so these are all interesting things that that will happen and i think banks want to play in that because they see a chance now for the liner shipping space certainly to be seen more of as a as a part of the logistics world, mm -hmm. uh, which is higher rated. Uh, of course, it's also overbanked, uh, which means more competition for you know Gaurav and me uh, in, in in that space. But I think those are the kinds of changes that you'll see. And, and again, going back to the pivoting and hydrocarbon and tanker stuff, um, LNG uh, certainly will attract money. Um, any any. Um, uh, new thinking around offshore wind farms, floating wind farms, because of the ESG angle, that will attract funding. Uh, governments will have to support these because right now there is no um, mechanism to support new technology with non-recourse, with, uh, you know, with, with funding that isn't government supported. So we'll have to see new, new structures emerging to support that. But I think bank financing capacity is there at the right price and for quality borrowers it's never been an issue. Excellent. Thank you very much. Gaurav, could I could I just invite you to, to give your thoughts on this? Sure. Um, I think I largely echo what Shreya said and I was just thinking, I think as you said, bank debt is there to stay. It is the cheapest form of capital that is available to most companies. And I think that cannot go away. But I think increasingly being the cheapest form of capital, it is going to take the best slice of the risk. And uh, I think there is a little bit uh, improvement that is coming over the years on that. But again, I see from where I'm sitting, there's plenty of capital available for most projects. I think it's more a function of being efficient about it, trying to improve those terms, what type of LTV, what type of tenors, what type of pricing can you achieve? Um, and just really trying to squeeze that out and optimize that mix. I think most good shipping companies now are sort of mixing that up. You know, you don't want to be over reliant on bank debt and for different types of projects or vessels in your portfolio. You can look at leasing options or you can look at private funding um, or, or the bond markets. And I think there has to be a mix because I don't think there is a sort of one size fits all uh, yeah. approach to be there. Um, and just looking at sort of what are the segments that we think that are going to be important. Um, while we sort of watch all these markets closely, for us, it's always been a sort of a dual lens of looking at the industry or the segment and the clients themselves. I think it's uh, the trick, the challenge, or the discipline, whatever we want to call it, is is not to get caught up in the whole exuberance of the cycles and just because you know a segment is doing well or get drawn into it. And it sounds fairly commonsensical and it's easier said than done. And just lean into a segment because it's doing well at that point in time because the numbers just add up better um, yeah. that is something that will continue for us and um, we have to take a sensible approach and we have to go with plants who are taking a sensible approach to the cycles as you said what are they going to do with this uh, with the good years and uh, we need to see that the track record and the ability in the balance sheet strength to withstand those down cycles is there so uh, because they will come uh, we can't have some of these runs forever and uh, that is also how we would select sort of what type of deals we do. 
Lovely. Thank you for those for those comments and and your your point um, uh, about you, you know diversifying sources of capital uh, struck me and I think is a nice segue to the next question which I wanted to ask um, Kim and and Ian and maybe Kim you could you could lead off on it which really is you know looking forward to the, into the next couple of years what sources of capital uh, look to you to be um, the most interesting and attractive um, over that over that period Kim. Yeah, I think I heard two things. I also heard the uh, uh, bank did this year to stay. <laughs> so for Me us, too. Uh, Me too. <laughs> we have uh, definitely uh, planned to maintain our strong relationship with our core banks. Uh, we have a very uh, good bank group uh, focused and dedicated to uh, to the industry and to uh, to Tom as a company. So we are extremely happy with that, and we we actually see that uh, uh, develop further going forward. Um, and uh, and of course there are uh, projects uh, some banks like more than others could be age could be segments could be uh, eco focus and so forth uh, and then more opportunistically uh, we as we've done for for a long time look into leasing opportunities there are some things there that are interesting it could be leverage it could be optionality of course uh, which is uh, an interesting element to uh, to think about also and to uh, to a part of your uh, debt portfolio. Coming to bond, uh, I agree it is good for diversification uh, purposes uh, or special purposes. I think for us currently, I don't find it that attractive. Uh, of course, we're looking into it. We are constantly uh, monitoring it. I still find it too uh, too expensive. Uh, also. From diversification uh, uh, purposes, so I'm not there right now. And then just on top of that, uh, ESG is there. I, I think there was a comment on uh, the right projects, the right strategy, and so forth. It's just there, no doubt. <coughs> yeah. After folks, it will be an inherent part of uh, what we're doing going forward. So of course, I think structure ESG will develop. Also, it's been quite simple right now. It will probably be more uh, developed also. Indeed. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Ian, over to you. Well, echo echoing much of what Kim has just said, actually, you need to keep your options open. Um, as, a, as an owner of 43 container ships, the vast majority of our uh, debt is um, senior secured lending provided by banks, um, not, not necessarily the mainstream banks, but, but some, and some of the smaller European banks, and also alternate capital providers um, uh, with similarly structured uh, transactions, so like like the Hafen uh, deal that we announced earlier in in the year. So it's not just regular way traditional banks; it's other folks who want to lend into the sector on similar terms. Now we've also had experience of high yield. It was expensive. It was necessary at the time, 2014 and 2017. Uh, it was the only thing that was available to us in a previous life. Um, now we 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 still have a foothold in those public debt markets with unsecured corporate level um, baby bonds. Um, mm. Now that's that's not transformational, but it is additive uh, and provides incremental capital uh, to us with, with no covenants essentially, um, as does the perpetual preferred market. Now these public markets, as people know, open and close, and you need to be able to move pretty quickly to access that capital. Um, and it's also helpful to have, have a use of, of proceeds. Uh, and, and for us, that's growth. Um, investing in moving slightly towards the ESG, investing in existing tonnage and not adding to the carbon footprint by building new ships, uh, but maximizing the use of existing existing ships, which we would hope to buy at a relatively small premium to scrap value, therefore minimizing risk to lenders and maximizing the economics to us. And, and that's where we look to be um, developing relationships and taking transactions forward through 2021. Very interesting. Thanks very much, Ian. So we're going to um, we're going to move now to um, the leasing world and to invite Torelling to talk a little bit about um, Chinese leasing um, as we as we move forward into into this new year. So Torelling, do do you see it continuing to expand? It has expanded quite rapidly over the last uh, few years, and, I, and in particular, could you? Um, so could you focus on what what assets the the Chinese leasing houses you think sure. um, would be most interested in? You, you know, looking forward. Uh, I mean, yes, I can do that. Um, so, S Marine, being based in Shanghai, has uh, been involved in lease fund, in arranging lease finance since 2014, and 
and we've seen a tremendous growth since over the last seven to eight years, you know, where Chinese leasing has developed from a marginal provider into becoming a major force in international ship finance. And uh, and, and uh, we clearly see that will be a, will, will, will continue. I mean, we have about 15 companies uh, uh, involved in, in, in uh, leasing in China, in, in international leasing from China, and the majority of those are owned by banks. In in, in Esmarine, we, we we do an annual survey of the of the leasing market, and the, 20, the, the, the 2020 survey is just out. And our main findings is that the volumes last year, the total portfolio of the, of the leasing houses last year was about 66.5 billion US dollars, which is up from 55 billion the year before, and substantially up from when we started to do these surveys in 2016. And and uh, and drawdown for new financing last year was about 14.7 billion, a little bit down from the year before at 15.8, but higher than what you've seen in the in the previous year. So I think you, the main conclusion from our survey is that the volumes last year were high and, and Chinese leasing remained an important factor in the market. And that's going to be the case also going forward. You know, uh, Then there is, of course, a time lag from initiating a, a transaction and closing it. and and the situation we've seen during 2020 uh, might have an impact on on the final volumes we will see this year. But uh, but as I said, still we believe there will be a, a continued uh, growth, but maybe at the at the slower pace. What we also might see is that the leasing companies might become a little bit more selective in the choice of business. Um, and and, and uh, but they are big in the market already, and they have the ability to grow. So I think that will continue to be the case. It's also important to know, note that the individual leasing houses are different in, in size, in their focus, and also in the terms and conditions they offer. So, so, so I mean, the, the, the various leasing houses may or will, or will most likely target different clients. So, so, so they will cover a large share of the market also in the future. But I mean, they will not, they will not be the savior for everyone who doesn't get bank financing. Uh, but 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 they will continue to serve a large part of the international shipping community. Um, and just to understand kind of their the, the position, just I wanted to, to show briefly the difference between what the leasing house, Chinese leasing houses can offer and what the banks are doing. I mean, basically a leasing house would be the sole, sole provider of a financing, also for transactions where the in the banking market it might be a syndicated loan. And, and they typically can do a higher leverage than what you see in the banking market and a longer tenor, which of course, on the other hand, is, is, is compensated by a, by a somewhat higher pricing, uh, which is kind of logical because they offer something different. The typical transactions these days are, are probably priced in the 300 to 375 basis points range. Some transactions are priced higher, higher and maybe into the 400. And, some transactions can also be priced below 300s for very strong companies. And the other thing with the leasing houses, they can also offer fixed uh, interest rate, uh, and that could be made, could be an attractive proposition in, in in the current market. In terms of assets, I mean, basically they, there's a preference to do modern vessels and new buildings or or or, or fairly new vessels. But there is not a requirement that the vessels are built in China. It can be Japanese built or Korean built. Uh, and, and of course, there is a preference for a standard, more liquid tonnage that's easier to finance. And if you get into more specialized vessels, I mean, employment and, and balance sheet considerations becomes more important. When you talk about deal size, I would say that, you know, 20, 30, maybe 50 million up to 75 to 100 million for the smaller, medium-sized leasing companies. And if you talk about the, the bigger companies, they probably start more in the 75 to 100 million range and can go into the several hundred millions on, in, 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 in some cases. Uh, and you know, the, the leasing companies often look for the same clients like the banks are doing. But I mean, as I said, the, the product is, is, is a bit different. So, so it could be complementary to what the banks are doing. And I, I think for, for for companies, it might make sense to have a combination of bank and leasing fi Chinese leasing financing, you know, from a balance sheet point of view, but also may for, as a way to diversify funding sources and, into, and have access to the to the Chinese 
market, which I mean, it provides a substantial part of international ship finance. So, I mean, just to, 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 to sum up, to finalize, as I said in the beginning, I, we, we are convinced that, you know, the, the Chinese leasing will continue to play an important role also in the years to come. And, uh, yeah. Thanks, Sir Alec. That's 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 great. Um, I'm conscious I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to jump to um, uh, ask a question about um, um, shipping and the debt and equity capital markets. Anybody who saw the front page of the UK FT today may have been pretty shocked in a way to, to see the um, level of um, e equity and, um, and bond issuances in, in um, the first three weeks of 2021. And of course, I'm not talking about shipping here. I'm talking um, more, more generally than that. But um, it'd be helpful to have a view from, um, from you on, on likely appetite for the debt and equity capital market. So maybe let's start with the bankers. Gaurav, do you, do you want to kick off on that? Sure. Um, I think uh, in terms of appetite, I think we just we did touch upon it earlier. I think there is there is sufficient appetite for uh, for uh, good projects and good companies, and I don't think that goes away at all. I think it's going to be uh, banks are keen to grow the portfolio. I think one of the things uh, that we do think about is uh, really what are the opportunities that are going to present themselves. And I think one of the things that we have to think about is probably say the CAPEX program. And I think for a lot of these companies, uh, as we know, the order books are at their historic lows uh, across almost all segments. Uh, so I think the question we also have to ask is in the absence of a major CAPEX plan, how are we all going to go that pie? Uh, or do we really need to? And uh, if you just end, going to end up doing refinancings and the fleet ages, your exposure will go down. So. And for and shipping is a is an amortizing loan business. So for for most banks, your current portfolios are running down uh, every day, every quarter. So it's also just a, a way to sort of replace that. Uh, you have to add on some pretty significant uh, delta to see some real growth in that portfolio. So I think it's uh, it's not just a function of appetite as I see it. It's also just going to be what is out there in the market. And yes, I think we just going, we are going to see some. The new segments evolve, uh, and I think Shreyas, you touched on it, you know, the offshore wind farm support, etc., which are going to be very interesting segments. Uh, but most of the bread and butter business will also be a function of the apex in the industry. Thank you, Gaurav. Um, Shreyas, any any other comments on on the public markets briefly? Well, well I'd love to advertise public markets as being open and and easy to access. The reality is. It's, it's not easy because shipping is such a small part of the overall public market issuance. And the kind of attention you get is frankly fairly limited. And, and there's a lot of fatigue on the parts of you know uh, clients who are doing non-deal roadshows and then telling the same story over and over to someone who has only a passing interest or passing knowledge of, of the industry and people who, you know, who assess a, a container shipping company by looking at the Baltic Dry Index I and mean, th things like that. Yeah. It, it's it's it takes a lot of work, and that's why banks are you know important because they have to tell the story halfway there and then and then set the scene so that the client can get there. But it, it is a struggle, and and um, it's 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 in the end worth it if you hit it at the right spot in the sweet spot, and then you know uh, it's it's difficult to call those. But there is a a, a limitation uh, at the start from uh, the fact that this is a very small part of the issuing community. Mm. And I think that's that's something that you can't really just easily fix. Mm. So you have to have good advisors, you've got to have good structuring, you've got to have preparation to pay, you've got to have preparation to have security uh, and, and other things that you normally wouldn't see in other, uh, other issuing um, uh, processes. So <laughs> that's... That's that's my that's my two cents. I Lovely, guess. thank you. And Ian, I think I'd like to come to you to to you know to ask you you've um you know you've been through um the the uh, you know the grindstone of the public markets the last I guess the last five six years. So would you like to make any comments on on that? Maybe reflecting on what Shreyas has, has said. Well, I, I, I certainly agree with Shreyas's observation that um, the maritime sector is tiny in in the the broader. Uh, capital markets, be it debt or equity, um, and 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 within that, container shipping, which is my area, is is proportionately even smaller. 
Yeah, yes. folk understand tankers and dry bulk, and they don't understand container ships or container shipping. Um, but currently, we love the capital markets. We've we've been <laughs> successful. Um, we we were successful in raising high yield twice, and we were we've been successful in raising equity twice. Um, but it isn't it isn't a particularly deep. The pockets aren't that deep. Um, and someone was talking about projects and so on and so forth. In in our business, you know, we we can't agree to buy ships subject to finance. We have to have the capital available to move quickly uh, to buy secondhand ships. Uh, yes. That means we have to have the cash in our bank accounts on our balance sheet, and that means because you can't raise debt capital if if you've got no assets. So that means quasi equity or equity, which is one of the motivations for us to raise it. So. So those of us who have got a public float um, and, and don't have access to private equity or don't want private equity have to bite the bullet and, and have to raise uh, public uh, equity capital with, with all of the challenges that, that Treyas um, suggested. Thanks, Ian. You have, to, Kim, you, have to, you have to pick your moment. You do. Kim, um, you've got a dual listing, of course, and uh, so interested in your thoughts. Yeah, I think I will... Uh, talk about the uh, the equity markets then, uh, because we don't have any public debt, so I think that's more uh, more uh, relevant for us. Uh, of course, we are looking forward to the, a market rebound later this year uh, on the backside of uh, the vaccine rollout um, in uh, basically all over all over the globe. Uh, we believe we will see an an asset repricing and a, a rebound. Then we are in a new situation. Uh, and uh, and think about back before we hit uh, COVID-19, uh, the pandemic uh, pricing was uh, pretty okay in our markets. Actually, uh, we will get back to uh, uh, to those levels uh, once again. We believe in a positive momentum because the liquidity is there, because mm -hmm. the the uh, so the the underlying support from uh, uh, governmental schemes and so forth is there for for the uh, for the whole uh, the, the macroeconomic situation as such, and then the underlying drivers in the product tanker market are especially good uh, and has evolved positively on the new ship, uh, ship supply side due to uh, the new new uh, tech uh, uh, need you can say, and then the refinery closures, uh, scrapping uh, potentials coming up over the coming years and so forth. So there are some underlying drivers in our markets that will support our industry as such. It's still a small market as, uh, as you, the rest of you have said, but we, we believe that uh, let's say uh, two quarters from now is we're in a new situation with uh, quite interesting uh, equity capital markets for us to look into. Thank you, Thank you very much, Kim. I think we're uh, at time. I can, see, I can see Kevin there. So Kevin. Yeah. Stuart, if I can come in just for a moment, please, to ask sure. a couple of questions which have come in. Uh, you know, earlier on during the ESG discussion, uh, it was suggested that ESG uh, may be extremely tough for the smaller companies uh, to handle, and that may cause more consolidation in the market. So a question to Gaurav and Shreyas. I mean, you know, this sort of shift to quality into the bigger companies is becoming more and more evident and probably will be the case for a couple of years to come, which will be presumably mean there's been more and more competition amongst the lenders. Um, might we see a case of deja vu from you know sometime in the past when your know, terms like th those owners, those strong owners, demand such terms that perhaps it might not just it's simply not interesting enough to finance to these people, Treyas? However good they may be, you know. Yeah, um, it's possible that it creates a dual tier market where there are those who can meet the conditions of the charters and there are those who can't. But there is also an opportunity here for smaller companies who want to fill in the gaps that the larger companies are too slow to fill. And here I'm thinking about you know, a large fleet um, management to a charter mandate is not as easy as just overnight retrofitting some ships or changing the kind of fuel. Slow, bigger companies are, are slower. Smaller companies are faster. This is a fact. And, and I think there might be an opportunity for those. Now, cost of capital, yes, I think there might be a marginal higher cost of capital for, for smaller companies. But I think the ESG financing landscape itself is evolving very quickly. We are seeing um, interest in ESG funded projects, not just from governments, 
but also from funds from BE houses, others who have created separate pools to address that need. So I think I think there is an opportunity that could be tapped, but people have to be on their toes and have excellent relationships with charters, which could actually support that. Gaurav, any further comment? Um, yes, I think uh, it's true. I think there will be uh, going forward. There will be, from a bank's perspective, there will be a bit of a increased requirement from the owners. And I think that is going to be that is coming in the next few years. Uh, we are seeing signs of that already. I think what is also going to happen is a little bit more uh, discipline around what is really sustainability. I think what we've seen in the last even 12 months is an evolution when it comes to even shipping as to what we define as a sustainability linked product. Uh, and I think it's going to get uh, stricter as I see it. There, there can't be, there'll be fewer instances of greenwashing. Uh, I think there will be, it has to go beyond sort of a lip service or a buzzword or a PR exercise. So we're going to see that transition. So I think we all have to be prepared for that. Okay, thank you. And a final question to Ian and Kim, perhaps. I mean, you mentioned that uh, last year was a year of two halves. In the first half of the year, it was considerably more difficult to do your financing. Terms were tougher and all the rest of it. And then in the second half, when the market improved, of course, things changed. Did that surprise you? I mean, and are you surprised generally how quick the finance landscape uh, changes? Ian? Well, it's... Um... I suppose so. I mean, it follows the trends of the sector, the underlying sector. We we were, I think, collectively surprised how strong the recovery was in container in the container space. Um, although the underlying fundamentals of, of supply, particularly of mid-sized and smaller ships, which is where we focus, and the vast majority of global trade is carried, is pretty pretty positive. And but ESG partly is is depressing the order book. People aren't going to invest in brand new ships that are, have an economic life of 30 years if they potentially obsolete in 10 years time because fuel changes. Um, uh, so I, I'm not surprised that there was more interest from financiers in um, helping us and, and I can only speak from our experience, um, you know, get ourselves um, refinanced on our, our bond toward the, the, the last part of the year because the container, container sector was going gangbusters and looks as if it's going to continue to. So let, let's hope capital is available for the right projects um, that, that don't add capacity to the container ship market and to the right borrowers. Mm -hmm. And it came the same thing. I mean, you know, when, when, you, when you think about it, I mean, the shipping markets are not really predictable, particularly predictable, more than six months out. And yet financiers sort of have, you know, they, they come in and out sort of often depending on the market at that particular time. Does that surprise you? Uh, I think uh, I agree with Ian on uh, this is not a this has not been a bank crisis. This has been a, a market uh, disruption, uh, but uh, then supported by uh, basically a unanimous governmental support and uh, huge packages, so that we return to uh, good uh, conditions is uh, really not that big a surprise. Uh, uh, and the dynamics of our market are well known to banks, uh, so they know we're in the middle. Of, we had a good uh, first half last year. Uh, it was a record high first half year, so as such, the 2020 was an okay year for most of us, I think, in our line of business. So uh, it's been okay. Uh, 2021 is uh, it's going to be okay. Also, it's not going to be uh, as uh, 2020, but uh, we will see the return going into the second half. So. No, I'm not that surprised, and I actually also agree. I think it was new Kurab uh, who said that uh, um, this is an uh, amortization business, so uh, it is uh, running out of uh, the books uh, day by day. So uh, I think appetite is there. And when we talk to our counterparties, um, you can say allocation-wise, it has not changed. Uh, I have not heard that from any single bank. Uh, their uh, industry allocations are the same. So of course they're looking into interesting uh, projects and having lesser projects increase the, uh, the basic uh, uh, support to whatever projects we uh, bring along. So no, uh, that's what I'd Very good, thank you. So we're out of time. So I'd like to uh, thank uh, Stuart, Torarling, Kim, Gwarav, Shreyas and Ian for the uh, discussion. All very interesting. We look forward to seeing you in, uh, in, in person, I hope, at our next event. And uh, that, that hopefully that will be very soon. Uh, to all of you listening in, thank you very much.
Uh, and if you'd like to join us for session five, our last session, it will be in about uh, 45 minutes. And it's a look, a look into the crystal ball, the year ahead when the world moves forward. For now, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks all. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye-bye.